You're welcome back. It's still the run-up, and uh, we promised that we're going to be talking about the role of religion in politics, in Nigeria specifically. Religion has always been manipulated for political ends, particularly in our country, Nigeria. Besides ethnic considerations, the two major faiths dominate the political scene, that is Christian and Muslim. With the elections in view, and it is one week uh, which is keenly participated in across the nation, we we'll look at the place of religion in politics today and the implications of religious influences in Nigerian politics for national development. Joining us right now is the Christian Association uh, Chairman, Association of Nigeria Chairman in Kaduna State, Reverend Joseph Hayab. Good morning and welcome to the program, sir. Thank you for having me. Good morning, viewers. Okay. Um, coming from Kaduna, I think the first thing to ask you is. What is it like uh, for the Christians? What are they feeling about the forthcoming election? Well, the forthcoming election, like any other election, affords us an opportunity again to choose leaders. And so we are getting ready and sensitizing our people to ensure that they come out and cast their vote. But as uh, I heard you said earlier today, one of the challenges we are facing is the issue of the manipulation of religion during most of this election period. For us in Kaduna, we have suffered in this kind of things. And what we are doing today is to encourage our people to, in the first place, look at the entire contestants. Who can deliver service? Who can bring about development? Who can treat every citizen equal? Who is going to obey and ensure that the rule of law is properly carry out in the state. Then we go for him. We vote for him. We're not going to vote anybody because he comes from our faith. Neither are we going to vote anybody because he's of our tribe. But we truly need someone who can respect us as citizens, who can allow our voice to be heard as people of the state. Okay, so what can the church, for instance, do uh, to influence the political climate, as it were, uh, or is the church just going to fold its hands and say, because we are the church, we are not going to participate, we are not going to say anything except just go to election and vote? No, you... I don't belong to that school of thought. And the leadership of Khan in Kaduna State also do not belong to that school of thought. And a larger segment of our pastors do not belong to that school of thought. You see, every human being is a political animal. That's one thing that we must emphasize. And there is nowhere in the Bible that says that we shouldn't get involved in the activities that brings about governance or in the governance of our land. Let me put it this way. The Bible in Romans chapter 13, verse 1 to 5 says, every authority is established by God. And so God expects us to obey governing authority. I don't understand why God will ask me to obey governing authority if he's not interested that I should also be part of that authority. Since God will not want us to have anything to do with Satan, the Bible tells us to resist the enemy, to resist the devil. So there's a difference between telling us to resist the devil and obey. So obeying shows that we are obeying what God approved. And the same Bible teaches that when the righteous rule, the people are happy. So the Bible cannot tell me about righteous ruling and bring happiness to people, and then I claim to be a child of God and a child of righteousness, and I feel I cannot be part of it. The difference here is that where people insist that the governor or the leader must come from their tribe or their religion is where probably some of us will share that opinion. But involving in politics is a civic responsibility. Don't forget, before I became a Christian, I was first a Nigerian. I was born a Nigerian. I have always tell people who do not understand Christian theology that Christian theology teaches that you are not a Christian just because you are born in a Christian home. You become a Christian when you give your life to Jesus Christ. But I became a Nigerian the moment I'm born in Nigeria, whether I'm a Christian or not a Christian. So I was first a Nigerian before I became a Christian. So I cannot abandon, and God wants me to ensure that the land where I live, there is peace. The land where I live, there is progress. And he even asked me to pray for the peace of that land. So why should I be praying and wishing that land progress and I'm not involved in making that progress? So there's no way in the Bible that says Christians should not be in politics. What probably has been this confusion today is because there are people out there who play politics wrongly, who play politics with evil, who play politics without love, who play politics without tolerance. And so they make people say politics is a dirty game. And so people think that anybody who goes into politics will also be robbed with that debt. If that is true, then that's where a true Christian comes to play. 
He goes into politics to clean the debt and make politics a place of people loving one another and wanting to develop their country. Okay, Bayo, before I ask him the final question, I hand him over to you. Bayo. Okay, Reverend, I, I was hoping that my colleague will have some questions for you before I continue. But yes, um, I'm back now. Sorry. Okay, uh, yes. There was, there was a slight technical problem. Okay. Uh, Reverend Hayab, thank you very much for, for joining us and for what you have been sharing with us so far. Um, today, uh, we witness, uh, I don't know if it's the same in Kaduna State, but we witness a massive, uh, so, uh, a massive, uh, if you like, disenchantment with the state uh, to the extent where you won't find people hardly obey traffic rules. Uh, people do certain things that are not right. And we've been wondering whether there's a role for the church, because the church actually is for religious bodies, but because we're a Christian, we're just saying the church. Because we find out that religious bodies have a very big influence on people. They are probably the only ones that most of the population today would listen to, because there's some sort of a disenchantment with the politicians. So how can religious bodies influence our society for good and bring back values that we seem to have lost in our country? Yeah, thank you very much for that question. The truth about it is that uh, we know that the history of the church in Nigeria is a history of an institution that plays a very vital role in character molding, in education, in providing services that make people happy. And at that time, the way and manner people who send their children to mission school believe is that when a child goes to mission school, he will learn obedience, he will learn discipline, he will be responsible. Unfortunately, our society has been polluted today that people violate rules, they don't care. People violate uh, simple instruction, they don't even think it matters, which is really bad for all of us. Do I blame it to uh, the kind of upbringing at home? Do we blame it to poverty? Do we also blame it to religious leaders? Or do we blame it to uh, politicians who actually do things? All other factors can be put into why we are where we are today. But I agree with you. Religious leaders and religious institutions have the role to play in reminding people that simple traffic obedience tells who you are. If you drive and the traffic shows red and you still drive on, it tells who you are. You cannot have a sticker in your car that will come, uh, you must be born again, and when you go and violate traffic rules, you are not born again, brother, and you have not preached born again. You rather preach that the person shouldn't believe in the faith that you profess. So most Christians who obey traffic rules have not have forgotten that they are giving their testimony. They are denting their testimony. That's why I respect some churches. I don't want to start mentioning names of church so that it does not become as if I'm promoting a particular donation. But there are churches that teaches members discipline. Are you in a building station? Join the queue. Are you in a hospital? Don't shunt. Allow the time, your time to come. Anywhere you go, show orderliness. After all, the Bible says our God is not an author of confusion, but he likes orderliness. Why do we have service liturgy? Because we want to do it in, the, in order. There is nowhere in the Bible that says service liturgy, we have a prayer, we have announcement, we have a preaching, we have an uh, offering. But we, as organized as we are, pro prepare the liturgy and give time for everything so that there will be orderliness in the process of service. Why can't we do the same in our land? Why can't we do the same when we drive? How can we do the same when we go to hospital? You see, the other day I went to a restaurant and I ate food. When I was done, I picked my plate. And my driver was, ah, that, that. I said, no, wait a minute. I travel a lot to Europe. There are certain places I'm not going to eat and leave the plate there. Why should I eat in Nigeria and abandon the plate there? Because nobody cares. So we must begin to show practical examples. But you know the nation is such a wide nation, and then there are different interests in this country that sometimes if you think you want to be obedient, you will see some people violating that's where your patient will be tested, whether you want to do like them or you want to show them good examples. And sometimes even when you are saying you are showing good example, to them they are just seeing you as a weak person. So you don't want them to see you as a weak person and you want to show that you are also strong. So these are many mistakes. But it keeps destroying the image of our country, the testimony of our country. So religious leaders must first show the lead. I was invited to a program yesterday and I went there much earlier than everybody. Ah, you're supposed to call to know people have come before you come. I said, no, 
The invitation tells me the time, and I must come here before the time. I won't come here and expect people uh, to come before me, no. I should also come like them so that they will learn to know what it means to keep time. So these are many others I think that we really need to do. And how do we correct it? Go back into a proper home bringing, or, or, uh, home upbringing. And don't forget, we used to have Sunday school those times that children go. Now our children don't go to Sunday school, so they don't learn anything that will help them shaping their thinking. A child that has not even grown to the age of 18, his father wants him to drive. So you can see the real reason why we keep violating our rules and there's no obedience. So religions have a role to play. But what example are we also as religious people showing? That is the question that we need to all answer. Okay, but uh, a lot of people get worried. Um, you've touched on it a little bit, but a lot of people get worried that even now in Nigeria, the, the churches are growing, the number of churches are growing so much, and what is expected to come out of a society that has so many churches or religious bodies, because like Bio said, it's not only for Christianity now, but religious bodies are growing by the day. And uh, these values still seem to be dropping. Where? did religion lose it? Because if we have good citizens in all the churches, in all the mosques, and all other religious uh, bodies, then this society called Nigeria will be better because people who are very good are being produced, so to speak, by these bodies. Where did we lose it, especially the church? Well, one among many areas where we lose it is when we begin to celebrate people who are rich, people who are famous, people who have houses, people who are popular, not celebrating people who do wonderful acts of humanity. Uh, that is where we begin to lose it. When the priority of, on who we celebrate, the priority on who we think is important, becomes more on what the person has or the status of the person in society. I think that's where we get it wrong. We must begin to respect every individual, whether he is a cleaner, whether he is a motor mechanic, whether he is just uh, an artisan, whatever kind of job he is doing, he is a human being. The first point of entry is human being. And you see, the church is supposed to show this example because in church, we don't elect elders or leaders in church or deacons in church by the office they hold. We elect them by the character they exhibit in church. But you still find that in some churches, whoever must be recognized, whoever must be given a front seat must be a very important person. I belong to a Baptist church where we try to teach the doctrine of separation of church and state. And what that doctrine simply means is not that the church cannot be in politics, not that the church has no business with the state, but what that doctrine simply means is that when we come to church, anybody who comes to church first comes to church as a Christian, as a member, and have come to fellowship. If he's a president of that country, if he's only the president in Rock, not in church. If he's a governor, he's only a governor in Alausa or a governor in so I'm saying that uh, all of us must work hard. It's not just the church, it's from the home, even our schools. I grew up to go to school where if I do anything wrong, the school will discipline me. But today, uh, if school discipline your child, you see parents going to the school and they want to fight the school teacher. Uh, instead of supporting the school teacher to mold their child's uh, behavior, they are now abusing the school teacher and ridiculing him in front of their child. And so also in church or in the community, where in the past every child belongs to everybody in the community, but today in the community, children only belong to their father and their mother. The fact that the mother will tell you, who gives you the right to touch my son? So your child will misbehave, your child will spoil, your child will cause problems in the community, and you don't want anybody to correct it. So, so many things have gone wrong, and all attached to the quest for materialism and just fame in the community. People are not interested in good character. They just want to be rich. They don't want to be, they just want to be the most famous family. Uh, that's not what should be. I think we need to correct these things. And the church has a role to play. Parents too have a role to play. But government could also give an enable environment for these kind of things to work. Okay, since your time is limited, as you said, um, let me just take this last one. Uh, the election is coming. 45 days from now, or less than 45 days from now, uh, that there will be presidential and national assembly elections. Uh, you are the chairman of Khan in Kaduna, so you know the, the minds of Khan everywhere else in the country. 
what are the specific things that have been earmarked to make sure that when the election proper comes, it is going to be peaceful, it's going to be uh, fair, it, and people are going to participate. Are there programs earmarked by the church uh, to make sure this comes to be? Well, Reverend Hayab will rejoin us and take that last question. But Bayo, um, you've heard what he said. Maybe you have a comment or two on that. Definitely. Um, I think Reverend Hayab actually put a finger uh, to the, the, the challenges that we have been uh, talking about and trying to identify the root causes of those challenges. Uh, we have a, a system today where our values are, I mean, we, we, we are, do I say we are value deficient? And I think he actually was spot on, you know, in saying that uh, there's been a failure across many fronts, the home, the religious bodies, the school, and that the authorities have also not often provided uh, an enabling environment, you know, for all the others to, to play their roles. I mean, if, for example, you're stuck in traffic morning, after, morning and night, you, you, you have to leave home very early, you have to come back home very late, do you really have time to watch your child, to monitor your child? You know, unlike when we were growing up, you know, that wasn't the problem. You know, parents would monitor you. If you brought something that didn't belong to you back home, you, you had to explain. So he's explained it, I think, you know, uh, in trying to identify the, uh, the reasons uh, for this value-deficient society uh, that, is, that is increasingly becoming a threat. Let's face it. Uh, we don't really realize our values as a threat. Well, it's, it's really a serious issue because even if the church or the mosque will fail in that responsibility because of what the home front is churning out, then we have a bleak future in our hands. Um, but everything he said, I think the most important thing he touched about, he touched was that the home front needs a rejig of some sort. Uh, because if the child goes to school and is disciplined by a teacher, the parents go to fight the teacher. That means it's from the home. <laughs> if, if, yeah, if parents are modeling their children after uh, role models that in those days wouldn't have been role models, then it's from the home. And whatever happens in the home comes to the larger society, and we just see it as if it's a, a normal thing nowadays. It's, it's really a terrible thing. But how do we go about making the home recognize the values that used to be values. Now value, values are tied to money. The real definition of value, of something really important, is lost and replaced only by money. And that is a big issue that maybe we'll need another time to discuss. I don't know whether we need psychologists or we need uh, whoever will talk sense into us. But family, the family is collapsing, as it were. And then if it collapses, that means the society as well will collapse. 2023 election is coming, 45 days or less than 45 days, and everybody that will be coming to vote will come from a family. And how good are those families to translate into a good Nigeria? I don't know. Even though this is politics we're talking about, in your opinion, where can we start correcting this uh, problem where values are misplaced. Some things that are not supposed to be are the ones that we are now elevating and crowning them, make, giving glory to them instead of what really matters. Because when we were growing up, they would model you after a doctor because he does well in the society. He does, it's not necessarily because he's rich, but because he does an essential duty, a teacher, an engineer or somebody that is doing, giving back to the society something greater than what he's even earning. Now it's not the same thing. How do we go about this, Bayer? Um, if I just build on what uh, Reverend Hayab said, I think those, do uh, you want to call them centrifugal forces, uh, you know, or, or, or pillars of nation building? Let me use that. Mm -hmm. Pillars of nation building. Uh, the home, the school, uh, the church or the mosque, uh, you know, and, and so on. I think those 
we need some period of introspection uh, across all these places. Do we have the right kind of people teaching our children? Okay, so that they can complement whatever the parents would have taught them at home. Uh, do we have parents who also understand their roles? Okay, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, providing the right kind of, uh, uh, of, 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 uh, of the of right kind of values. Uh, do we have also with, around us in the church, in the mosque, leaders who lead by example? See, for instance, I tell people that when they say that our, uh, our, political, our politicians do not like uh, being questioned, I ask sometimes when we have this conversation with friends, who likes to be questioned? Is it the principal in the school? Is it the pastor or the imam? Many Nigerians don't like to be questioned. When people take public funds, because anything which is not yours, which is collected from people, is public funds. Whether you collect public funds in the Parent Teachers Association, or you collect it in the church, or you collect it in the mosque, you owe an explanation to those from whom you have collected it to explain to them how it is being used. But when people ask a question, you probably get a response that, the, are you doubting me? Do you think I've stolen your money? That's not the case, right? So people don't like to be questioned. Now, the same people who do not like to be questioned, we turn around and say that those in public office don't like to be questioned. Are those in public office not Nigerians? Are they from space, right? If you read, if you look at the newspapers, in the, in the public, the comment section of the newspapers, you cannot hold a different opinion without somebody abusing your father, abusing your parents. You just go to any newspaper that is published online in Nigeria and look at the, at the comments of the readers. They are busy abusing your ethnicity, they are busy abusing your parents, they are busy because you hold a different opinion. Yeah. So if, if, if we are behaving like this, we expect those who are in power who are Nigerians like us, to be different from us. So the values, the entire value uh, uh, orientation has to change. And I think we all have a responsibility. It's not just the government. We actually have more roles to play than the government does, in my view. Yeah, um, I'm just happy and sad at the same time because we were asking uh, Reverend Hayab what the ch church will do and all that, and he more or less threw back the responsibility at us because before you can go into the church, like he said, before he became a Christian, he was a Nigerian first, and before you can go into the church, you will come from a family, and if the family is rotting, uh, there's only so much that the church can do because they will teach you there and expect you to come and get a follow-up from home, which is not forthcoming, and it, it's, a, it's a case. So if we want a better Nigeria, it goes beyond just voting at elections. It, it also means that a lot of things have to be done. And I always use the example of the time after the war where they were going from village to village showing movies about how destructive a war could be so that the orientation of the people could change. There are small things that we can use in our movies, in our music, in so many things to censor Absolutely. Yeah, w whatever uh, the people who are coming up uh, will be thinking. Because slavery of the mind is worse than the chains that you have put in your hands. So how do we even begin to make our children begin to feel proud of themselves as be being Nigerians, to begin to look up or look for opportunities to do good, like we used to have uh, uh, heroes in those days, uh, how do we start to teach our children to do their civic responsibility and take responsibility for their actions? I don't, I don't even know you how to... You, you, you mentioned the, the music, the musicians, and I'm happy you did that. What today, what... See, when 30 years ago, what were Nigerian musicians singing about? Mm -hmm. And today, what are they singing about? And it just tells you straight away, because music is a reflection. Yeah. of the values of the society. Today, what are they singing about? Is it Hennessy? Somebody drinking Hennessy and enjoying? And what are our radio stations playing? 
Okay, when we worked in the radio station, there are certain kinds of music you cannot play in the morning. NTBB. Today, today you switch on the radio station in the morning on your way to work. What kind of music are you are you hearing on that station? Music that should not be played maybe until 9 p.m. at night. And then you ask yourself, because the government has a role here, what is the National Broadcasting Commission doing? Do they even monitor the stations? You know? So, so everyone has a role. And if all our musicians do is just sing about uh, brandy, parties, and then you celebrate them, and I'm sorry, you have, you have uh, reality shows which further complicate the value deficiency that we are talking about. And governors in Nigeria, political office holders in Nigeria, celebrate winners of those reality shows. What message are you sending to the others? You're saying the boy or girl who is studying hard at mathematics should not be celebrated. Mm. You know, somebody who is volunteering, but, you know, helping disabled people, sorry, persons with disability, or helping, you know, people who need help. Those kinds of people shouldn't be celebrated. So, so we all have a role. We are all contributing. So when people point to the government, it's wrong. Yes, the government has its own blame. But we have more blame when it comes to rebuilding our values. Interesting. Um, okay, let me ask you this. Maybe it's funny. Uh, what are some of the things that you miss from the old educational system that you think, if we had continued and built on that, could have helped our children grow to be more patriotic and more responsible than they are right now? Because of time, I'll just give you one example. Yeah. Just a few days ago, I was talking to my children, and I said, do you know that today, as an adult, I am beginning to value the uh, question, sorry, the uh, admonition that we needed to always eat a balanced diet. Mm -hmm. Because in primary school then, we were taught to ensure we ate a balanced diet, right? Now, today, there are many health issues. You know, we discuss with friends, all kinds of health issues. You take high chole bad cholesterol and other things. But you go back and realize that for as long as you consistently kept to eating a balanced diet, you are very unlikely to have these health issues. As basic as it sounds. Mm. But this thing was being taught in primary school. Yeah. But I'm not sure it's taught anymore in primary schools. I may be wrong. You know. Mm. So this is this just gives you an idea of the robust kind of engagement with pupils that existed in primary schools there. You walked on the road, you saw money on the ground, you you dare not pick it up. You saw elders, you showed respect. Mm. You know, I'm sure that we teach some of these values today, but the problem could be that when parents themselves are not well versed, they compromise the integrity of what is taught to the children at school. Or when the teachers are not well prepared, and then the parents are the ones doing the right teaching, then the teachers compromise that. And then you look at standards, as, as basic as, say, the English language that we speak. Some of our radio stations... They speak American English on those radio stations, right? But what is taught in our schools are supposed to be what you call, maybe you say King's English, English King's now. English. It's not <laughs> yeah. Queen's English anymore. Yeah. And the WAEC exam that you are going to write in English language would not say, for example, that somebody pled guilty. It's going to say somebody pleaded guilty. And if you wrote the person pled guilty at some radio stations, Will, in their news bulletins today, why it will fail you? So who is even responsible for ensuring consistency in not only the English language that we speak, but whether it's Yoruba or Igbo or Hausa or Kanuri or Bachaba or Tib or Idoma okay. or Efik that we teach, you know? So, the, so we all have a role to play, basically, in yeah. ensuring that the right values are cross-board are taught and, and yeah. sustained. Yeah, it's true. My, what, what I miss is very weird. Uh, manual labor in school. It taught me to value what 
I, I, what I can do with my hands, what, uh, take responsibility. Sometimes we had school farms and then you'll be given a bed, as we used to call it. You take care of it. And the joy of bringing something to life, as it were, was something else. And you took care of that thing, but it translates to something else in later life. You know, mm. you wake up early, you go fetch the water for your parents and all that. It translates to something else in later life. You sweep your own classroom. You do all those things. Now parents do not allow this, their children to go to maybe public schools that will have some of those things because they just want the easy life for the children. And I don't know how that works. Elsewhere, I know that even during the holiday, uh, students are encouraged to have holiday jobs so that they get hands-on yeah. experience on doing things and taking responsibility. But it's not happening in Nigeria. Well, I do hope. And they're made to volunteer. Just and quickly made to now. Volunteer. Yeah. Either the Boy Scout or the Girl's Guide or yes. what Sher Sherid does. They are made to volunteer, to understand and to respect not just the dignity of labor, but what it means to help without attaching monetary reward. Today, everybody's after money because we have forgotten to teach people to volunteer their time and skills. Well, uh, we'll take a break for the news. Uh, when we return, we just gist a little bit more with uh, bio, and that'll be it. Stay with us. You're welcome back. It's still the run-up, and I'm still here. I'm Gul Agaji, and bio Oloake is also there uh, waiting to welcome you back, and... Uh, let us finish the last lap of the journey. Bayo, are you still there? As always, uh, I'm here. And uh, it's an exciting place to be, uh, especially as elections are around mm. the corner. Yeah. Uh, you know, we were trying to talk about uh, the role of religion in politics. And we ended up being given the responsibility. The responsibility was placed squarely on the sh shoulders of everybody that we are all responsible for what is happening in Nigeria and what will happen in Nigeria. And it just got me thinking about a lot of things that we have left undone and taken for granted in our country, just looking for solutions from the government alone. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, everywhere our government often provides what we call the enabling environment. And then, of course, public functionaries have to show a uh, good example, you know. So I think outside of those two, uh, okay, maybe in some cases you need policy interventions as well. But largely, when we are talking of reorientation of our values, that responsibility is devolves more on us, mm. you know. Uh, and I mean, we can. I don't want to belabor the point. We, we've said so many things already. That responsibility rests on us. Yeah. And uh, like, like Reverend uh, Hayab said the other, uh, on the program this morning, whether we are also the kind of role models we are celebrating, mm -hmm. that's very important. Very. When people throw the naira on the floor at parties and they are stamping their, their feet on the naira, the national currency of their own country, mm -hmm. or some of them are even using the naira to stone they want to give the money to someone. And you see them stone. And you begin to wonder if we are rational people. I just Those wonder. who do these things are rational people. I just, I just wonder. Like some people say, the only religion they recognize is humanity. And maybe humanity in the hearts of a lot of people is dying. And if it is dying, it will affect every other thing that we've we feel is important in our lives. So we should start thinking uh, with moving side by side with any other religion that you identify with, you should know that humanity is also a religion that must be a part of you. Think how to do good, think how to love, think how to take responsibility and all that. But now when we talk about federal government, sometimes there are things that come up and you wonder what is really going on in the mind of politicians or those who are leading us, I really do not understand. I just saw this um, story that the federal government intends to hire doctors from abroad. You have seen that story. What do you make of it? The same doctors that yeah. are running away from Nigeria 
they will hire mm -hmm. doctors from abroad. That was my, my initial reaction when I saw the story. Uh, when I read it, I now saw that I think the whoever cast the headline uh, was trying to attract attention. Uh, and of course, we, we, we're journalists, okay? So I think, <laughs> I think the headline is in order from the point of view of wanting to attract attention. But basically what the government is saying uh, there is that there are some specialists. There are two things. One, the government is saying that the attraction of labor or labor mobility today uh, has become increasingly um, challenging for many countries. Okay? Of, of course, for those of us in developing countries, it's a lot more challenging because um, we will lose you know, our specialists, our skilled citizens, a lot faster you know, than countries where the conditions of service are relatively better. I'll come back to that. But the other point is specifically to this story about government hiring doctors from abroad is essentially saying that doctors with specialist skills will be attracted to come home uh, and lead certain interventions. And, and if, if I'm allowed, this was done severally by Gwenga Daniel when he was governor of Ubu State. I knew a lot of Ubu State doctors who were, who were coming to Ubu State to carry out either eye surgery or all kinds of surgical procedures. Maybe some other governors were doing that. And I see that this is basically what the federal government is talking about. They will bring these specialists uh, and then get them to do the interventions. And secondly, they will link the specialists to the educational system. Because a Professor Walesha Inka, for example, can lecture from wherever he is through the internet. You know, his lectures, if he's lecturing a specific subject, he can have 50,000 students in Nigeria joined by the internet. This is already happening elsewhere in the world. I don't think it's something new. Uh, and I think it's something we should be doing, especially where we cannot keep some of our skilled personnel. But now, coming back to the question of why we cannot keep our skilled personnel, um, I think that the, 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 the reward package, that is salary, uh, housing, and all those kinds of things, you know, the reward package for our staff in public institutions, and even private institutions as well, because don't forget that recently, many banks were complaining that they were losing their IT personnel uh, to foreign countries. You remember that, Yangu. Yeah. And this was very recent, you know. Uh, some, some, some two, three banks especially had very serious problems towards the end of last year when their online systems were failing and uh, consumers had a very big challenge accessing those. So it's not only government, you know. Private sector is losing people. This calls to question what our reward package is. So we can no longer be waiting until our staff go on strike, whether they are doctors or nurses or teachers. We really need to look at what is obtaining internationally today and begin to fix the reward package, not necessarily at the level of what is obtainable internationally, but reasonably closer to that yeah. in order for us to minimize the number of those who we leave. Okay, um, you know, and my, work wrong. you know, our time has run up anyway. But this this was my problem. I read that article, and each time I see when a problem, when the government faces a problem, and the first thing they say is is, is also happening in other countries, it beats me. I I don't, I've never liked it to say that because this thing is happening in another country, if it happens here, it's all right. Now, then again. They talked about bringing the specialists, whether they're connecting them to the schools and all that. Remember the case of China, for instance. When China wanted to become a world body, uh, a world power as it is today, they did, made, a, made a deliberate effort to send out their own people to go out to America, to UK, and wherever they had the best schools to study and come back. And whatever they need now in China is available in China. Why not bring back a program that will make sure that we have these specialist doctors that are ours. And like you said, the reward system be up to beat so that people, some people don't want to go out. 
if the conditions were just a little bit better than they are right now. But they are going out. And some, and some people have come back home. Uh, well, <laughs> we, we will never hear that one anyway, but because they are, they are few and far apart. But yeah, it beats yeah. me. I think there should be deliberate programs by the government to make sure that our people are trained, even if they have to have some kind of document to show that when you're trained, you have to work for a specific kind of time with the government or wherever you are, you work for us with the lower rate or something, whatever you want to put it. Because those doctors that will, even though they are Nigerians, wherever they are working from, the pay they will pay them will not be the ones they will pay the ones that are in Nigeria. Yeah, sure. I so, mean, you're talking about bonds. So we are... You know, look, yeah, we and, are... And, and this used to happen. Government will put you on a bond and say, we have trained you, mm -hmm. and so you have to work for maybe three years before you can leave. And let me say something. Many people probably would argue with me, but it is a fact. It costs a lot less to study medicine in Nigeria. It costs a lot, lot, lot less. And I have often wondered why... Uh, uh, you know, it, despite costing, you know, such a low amount comparatively, mm -hmm. doctors can just leave this country otherwise, right? So we need to make it attractive mm -hmm. uh, to keep our skilled personnel. Uh, but we are not going to stop it. See, the, the, the way labor is today, people will leave. But the problem is that, like you said, those who never even plan to leave are leaving simply because the reward package is very poor. And I think we should stop thinking that it's a Nigerian salary scale, uh, it's a Ghanaian salary scale, mm -hmm. it's a Gambian salary, there's nothing like that. You have a, now it's a global village. And if we are going to be talking of all these critical skills, we must pay them what is commensurate, reasonably, With you know, to. comparatively to what is, what is obtainable abroad. At least it will keep many of them here. Yes. Anyway, uh, that's the much we can take for today. Thank you very much, Bio, for being a part of the program today. My pleasure. And for the rest of you watching us, we like to say thank you to you. It's been a pleasure being with you. God willing, we'll return tomorrow with the run-up. Until then, my name is Nyam Gul Agaji. Bye.